Are you ready for the word? Are you? I have a word for you this morning, and we're going to go for it. And uh, I want to encourage you to never, never, never quit. Three times. Never, comma, never, comma, never quit. Don't even think about quitting, right? And when something happens, get your stuff back. Get your victory back. So we're going to go to David's life. David, man of faith, right? And what happened to him at a place called Ziklag. I'm going to give you seven things. So I'm committed this Sunday and then next Sunday. I'm going to talk about this, all right? So the next two Sundays, I'm going to minister on this. And I'm going to point out seven things that David did when something tragic happened in his life. This was a bad day. This was not a good day in David's life. This was a bad day. So 1 Samuel chapter 30, verse 1, it happened when David and his men, right, arrived home at their town of Ziklag, okay, Ziklag. They found that the Amalekites had made a raid into the Negev and Ziklag. They crushed Ziklag and burned it to the ground. So they're out serving God. They come back home. They found Ziklag, their, their city, their hometown, burnt down. And what happened in verse 2, if you read it, it says they took captives, the women, and everyone else in it, both young and old. They didn't kill anybody, but they took them off and they went their own way. So this is not a good day. David was out serving God. He comes back home. And, and let's put ourselves in, the, in, in his shoes, right? The town was burnt down. People have been taken away captive. His wives have been taken captive. You see how current and relevant the Bible is? This could be a headline from the newspaper six weeks ago. This has been going on thousands of years. And so these enemies raided Israel, burnt the city down, and took people away and took captive away, took them away. And so what do you do when that happens? How do you react when that happens? Because troubles and difficulties come to all of us, right? And it's burned down with fire. They find the city, verse 3, they find the city destroyed by fire. Their wives and sons and daughters taken captive. So your wife represents your affection. Your sons and your daughters are your future. So Satan attacked and took their love away and was trying to rob them of their future. So in this passage are seven things that David did. If we react and do these things, we can have victory in our lives. We do it the way that David did. So verse four, here's the first one. Verse four, David and the people who were with them lifted up their voices and wept until they had no more power to weep. So they cried. So here's my number one point out from this verse. I, I, I made a list for, for you guys. If you, I wrote them down. Go, go to the next slide, please. So number one, here's number one. Acknowledge the problem. David weeping, go, go to the next slide. So we'll look at verse four again. When David weeping, okay, the, the, uh, the city's destroyed, his home is burnt down, his wife is gone and the kids are gone, and him and the men weep. Now, this is facing the problem. This is acknowledging the problem. This is saying that there is a problem and it did happen. And so today, many times, we misunderstand faith by thinking that crying about something is not having faith. 
And that will actually cause you problems. If you do not, if you just bury things and not face them and not deal with them, in the end, you're going to have problems on the inside. You can't just bury things. If you bury things, it's like a volcano. The pressure builds and builds and builds. It'll come out in other ways eventually. But it would be a great misunderstanding of faith that if something happens, you're not allowed for a moment to feel it, to acknowledge it. That means you have to stay there. That means you have to stay. You're not supposed to stay down and depressed for weeks. But many times we find well-meaning people who immediately want to say, you know, well, just get happy anyways. Right? Okay, I get to get happy, but I need to process what just happened here. And so that's why the Bible says, weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. It's called empathy, and, and it's called recognizing and acknowledge what happened. So they cried. I mean, there's times that things happen in life that we don't understand and are difficult to process, and there's times where you know, things happen that will make you cry, that will make you stop. And, 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 and it seems that, and, and you can't always, right, um, blame it on lack of faith. It doesn't mean that lack of faith is the problem. So walking by faith is not, this is what it's not, right? Would you agree that David walked by faith? Did David walk by faith? He had the spirit of faith. David and Paul are the very definition of the spirit of faith. David is the one that penned, I have the spirit of faith, I believe and therefore I speak. Paul quoted David in the New Testament. Walking by faith does not mean that there will not be challenges in life. That's what walking by faith does not mean I'm not going to have any problems. You know, there was a part of me in my 20s when I got saved. I didn't hear anybody say this. I, I didn't study it, but, some, but I thought that. I don't know if anybody else thought this when you were younger, right? That I will eventually have so much faith that I will have no more problems in life. Somehow I thought that. It was a wrong thought, but I thought it. Thank God I didn't, I never taught it or I'd have to burn those teachings, right? I'd have to eliminate them. I never taught it, but I thought that I would grow to such a level in faith that I would reach a point in my life where I would have no problems. That, that's not what the Bible teaches. Um, Paul, the apostle Paul, had difficulties. You can't accuse him of not walking by faith, right? So it doesn't mean, walking by faith does not mean I will not have any difficulties to overcome, right? In fact, if you walk by faith, you may have more trouble than other people to overcome. Like I said, Paul had many troubles, but he overcame them all. Now, I'll take that direction next week. And it's not always for lack of faith. I went through the New Testament. I made a list of things. I found 10, uh, 10, 10 things that, that can cause things to happen that have nothing to do with lack of faith. Let me give you one for example. Unforgiveness will cause problems in your life. That's not lack of faith, it's unforgiveness. So you can have, you can have uh, all the faith that you want to, but unforgiveness will cause difficulties, will open the door to the enemy. Right? Won't it? Here's another one, stress and overworking. overworking. Now that happens to be one of my challenges in life. You know, we all have sins that easily trip us up. Well, I don't. Yeah, you do. It's called pride. Just by that statement, that trips you up. Yeah, you do. We all do. Things that, you know, can trip us up more than others. That happens to be one of them. Thank God it's not, it's not alcohol. You know, put a bottle of whiskey in front of me. I have, I'm not even tempted with that. It's, it's not uh, other things, but, you know, we pass going home 10 marijuana uh, places. I'm never tempted to go and smoke a joint. Thank God. But this is a temptation for me because I'm self-employed and I could work until I drop and never stop. 
And there's times that that got me in trouble. And you know, my voice would be under stress or something would happen in my body and, and God pointed out and says, you know, it's not lack of faith, it's your overworking, it's foolishness. You need to rest, right? But anyways, should we be judging why problems come to people? Should we be? We shouldn't, right? We shouldn't be judging, right? But there's just to help you, it's not always, you can't just reduce it to, well, it doesn't have enough faith. Well, I don't know that, I'm not in the heart, I don't know that, because there, there are, I've discovered there are other reasons. So, you know, if I keep on working too much and I get stressed out and, and you know, my immune system drops, it's not lack of faith, that's overworking, stress, right? But anyways, I'm not supposed to uh, judge. And so weep, right, means this, just acknowledge that it happened. Okay, this happened, I feel this one, it kind of hurts a little bit. If you start like that, you're not walking out of faith, it's your first step. How can you overcome something that you don't acknowledge has happened and that you don't face head on so that you can channel your faith towards it, right? So David was very honest with God. Read the Psalms, right? And he said, you know, we have to be honest. God desires truth in the inward parts. So I can, and that's where we can get into trouble, right? I'm having, through some, I'm having some difficulties and, and you know, I come to church, how are you? Oh, I'm just fine, bless God, praise God, and you're really hurting inside. Church should not be a place where we fake things, right? Now, you should not fall in the trap of complaining all the time. You understand that there's a balance, right? And then you have people, and I get that, that always repeat your problems to everybody. You should not be telling everybody your problems. That's an extreme that you should avoid. You need to find, I have, I have Two, right now I have two people that uh, I go to if I have difficulty and I have to open up with. One, I showed you the picture at the beginning of service, and then the other one is uh, uh, Dave McGrew, who's been with us for decades. I had uh, Bishop Tony Miller, but he went to heaven. <coughs> Glory. I've only had three, three pastor mentors in my life. And uh, the only reason why I changed is because they go to heaven. It's like a marriage to me. So I don't go tell everyone my problems. But you should have someone that you can tell your problems to. Someone safe. You don't want to say something and then half the church knows it. <laughs> right? Someone who won't judge you, won't condemn you. Someone who will listen, who will empathize. And then give you advice. And then will take you from there to... Uh, where you should be because you don't want to stay down. But there's empathy. There's a first step, right? And so you don't want to do that, complain about every little thing. And you don't want to have a victim mentality, right? But the balance in the Word of God, especially in the New Testament, is that not every day is a party and not every day is like a trial and, and, and desert. In life, we're going to have some days of one and some days of another. But even when we do have trials and difficulties, right? We know that God wants us to win. So there's number one. I'm going to get through it. Number one is acknowledge the problem. Everybody say acknowledge the problem. Okay. So now, verse five, we're going to keep on reading now. So they come home, they find everything burnt, right? David's two wives are taken away, they're captured. And then in verse six, it says, David was greatly distressed, right? For the people spoke of stoning him because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself and the Lord is God. So first thing we do is acknowledge a problem. Here's the second thing that we do is don't get bitter. Do not get bitter. <laughs> don't blame God. So look at the verse again. Keep on going. Here, 
notice the different reaction, right? Between David and the people. There is a difference between how David reacted and how the people reacted. Now, David is stressed out. Do you see that? Right? But the people are grieved. Because one is walking by faith and the other one isn't. So stressed out, what well, yeah, you're gonna feel, you know, if your house is burned down, even if you have faith, when you see it, your heart's gonna start pumping, isn't it? And you're gonna feel something, right? If if the, if it's real, because that stress, he's distressed. On top of the problem, here's why David is distressed. What do they want to do? They wanted to stone him. <laughs> Isn't that funny? Well, it's not funny, really, but works, you know, about, you know, David, you know, you told us that God is on our side, that God is good, that, you know, uh, we follow God and we will conquer and we will win and it's not working. You know, people will always blame the man of God. You can't see God. God is in heaven. And, you know, so the one you can take it out on is the one that teaches you about God. You can't grab God by the throat. You can grab me by the throat, right? <laughs> so on top of everything, not only is he going through the problem and his house being burned down and his wife being taken away, but on top of it, the people want to stone him, want to get rid of him. We're going to get another leader, right? So that distress, so this reaction that you have of breathing faster and your heart pumping and so on, is within, it, 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 it's a normal reaction. Now, the people are grieved, right? See, now there's a difference here. The Greek, David is not grieved. The people are grieved. And the word grieved is bitter. And the bitterness has to do with being upset with God, meaning God why did you do this to us? So we face the problem. We can and we should cry, but not get over into bitterness and blaming God. <clears throat> the, the New Testament makes a real important dis distinction about a sorrowing that is normal and a sorrowing that becomes bitterness. I'm referring to 1 Thessalonians 4.13 when the Apostle Paul said that uh, if someone goes to heaven, if a loved one goes to heaven, we sorrow, but we're not going to sorrow like those who have no hope. Do you see the distinction? This is important. So evidently, David was sad because he cried, but he didn't cry like those who have no hope, who have no God. So they do this, you know, in Italy, especially southern Italy where Connie's from. At funerals, they have professional mourners. They rip their hair out, right? They, they dive on the casket, right? You know, Jesus kicked those people out when he raised Jairus' daughter. They were professional mourners. That's what they did. Jesus kicked them out. We don't need that. All we need and all that's healthy is a godly sorrow. It's something like, yeah, this hurt, it happened, I get it but I'm not going to rip my hair out and fall on the casket and put on a religious show because in this case of those who have fallen asleep, what's the difference? Well, we have hope that one day we will see them. So yeah, we miss those loved ones who are in heaven, but we're not ripping our hair out because one day we will see them. Do you see the difference? So that's important, right? So, so there is a weeping where you can still be in faith and in hope. 
Yeah, I miss this person, but one day I will see them. Going back to David, right? Yeah, okay. This hurt, my house is destroyed, but God. See, that, that, that weeping with hope and weeping in faith will always add on at the end, but God. There's a difference, but, but there is a God. I believe in God, and if I trust him, he's going to make the difference. Even though I may not see it and I may not understand it, it will turn out right in the end because by definition, God is a redeemer. <clears throat> so you have to say to yourself, I don't understand this, but you know what? God doesn't do this to me. It's not God that burned the house down. It's not God that uh, had them take my wives away. It's not God that killed the person because God doesn't do that. Do you see that? All right, so we go on to number three. So one, we acknowledge the problem. Face it, okay? But don't get bitter. In, 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 your, in your wondering, in your, in your pain, in your trying to figure out what's going on, always tag on, but God, I trust you. God, I believe in you. God, you are redeemer. God, you love me too much. You're not the one that did this to me. You're not at fault, right? And then, the th here's the third, it's, it's found in verse 6, right? Encourage yourself in the Lord. So read, the, read uh, let's look at verse 6 again. Keep on going, right? David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. You have the Amplified Translation too, right, of this. It says that David encouraged and strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Tell me who encouraged David. Who encouraged him? Himself. Say, nobody loves me. Well, love yourself. <laughs> nobody encourages me. Well, encourage yourself. And nobody appreciates me. Appreciate yourself. <laughs> if you're a believer, you're going to have to learn the fine art of encouraging yourself. Because sometimes people around you want to take you out. They, they, they don't, they're not expressing love particularly to you, towards you. And so you and I have to learn the fine art of encouraging ourselves in the Lord, right? And, and, uh, quitting is not an option. And, and, and we don't want to quit. And we have to always challenge the temptation to quit. And the way we do that is by encouraging ourselves. Now I'm going to expound on some of these next week. I just want to go through the text this morning. I'm going to give you some ways in which you encourage yourself. But I already gave you how you do this. You always do it by tagging on, but God. Yeah, okay, this, I feel bad about this, I'm down but the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah, I feel this pain in my body, but by his stripes I am healed, right? Yeah, I feel weak today, but when I am weak, I am strong. You see the balance? You understand that if you feel weak, the way to overcome it is not by saying, I don't feel weak, I don't feel weak. You're lying if you say that. We're not supposed to lie, right? You don't say, I feel weak, and you say, no, I don't feel weak. That's lying. You say, when I'm weak, I'm strong. That's different. The Lord is the strength of my life. The Lord gives me strength. Yeah, yeah, I don't feel like I can do this, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's how you encourage yourself, right? So number one, tell me one again. What do you do? You face, you acknowledge what? Problem. Number two, right? Don't blame. Don't get bitter, okay? Number three, what do you do? You encourage yourself, right? In the Lord. <clears throat> verse seven. Verse eight. Just jump to verse eight. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this troop? Shall I overtake them? And he answered him, and the Lord answered, Pursue, 
for you shall surely overtake them and without fail recover all. So here's the fourth thing to do that David did. Get a plan of action from God. Get a plan of action from God. Are you listening? I find that, this is what I found, this is just my observation. Most people skip this verse. Um, I don't mean the verse, I mean this step. When something happens, the first thing that you should do is ask God, what do you want me to do? So see, you're not busy blaming him. You're not asking why, you're asking what. What's the plan of action? God, I know you're good. <clears throat> God, I know you're on my side. God, I know you give me victory. What do you want me to do? It's essential. Are you listening? Because every person is different and every situation is different. There's no shortcut to this. You have, you need a plan from God, right? And God, uh, go to the next slide. So it's verse 8 again, see? He says to him, right, yeah, go ahead. In this case, pursue. Go after them, overtake, and get your stuff back. Now, the reason why I say this is because, for example, this is not always the case. There was a similar situation in the book of Chronicles where they were also invaded, they were also attacked, right? And in this case, right, it was the Moabites that attacked. And in that case, Jehoshaphat was king. And what he did is he got a plan from God. And God gave a different answer this time. He gave a different plan. He didn't tell them, grab your sword and go fight. He said something which is quite the opposite, right? So here's what God said in this case. Look at it here. Listen, Judah, on you inhabitants of Jerusalem and King Jehoshaphat. Thus says the Lord, don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the battle is not yours, but God's. And what God had them do in this case is praise him. They didn't use the sword and God sent confusion. You remember it was similar um, with the walls of Jericho, right? They didn't have to use their sword. Uh, they sent the singers around, they were praising, and the walls fell. You understand where we miss it. Churches miss it, right? Because you have a church that'll take what David did, and they start a denomination. We're the ones that fight for our stuff. And that's the only way of doing it, they say. And they say everyone else that does it differently is wrong. Then you have someone else that'll latch on to 2 Chronicles 20, and they start a Reformed church. You know all the dash names of Reformed is because they're splits, right? No, we're the ones who praise God. But the, and then you start a church that's called the battle is not mine, it's the Lord's. And then they fight with one another. So, which is true? Well, both of them. Because they're both instructions from God. So you're going to have to ask him, this is essential. Ask him, God, what do I do about this? <clears throat> I have a lot of examples of this. You know, in the Bible, uh, in, uh, in my life, Right? And so, um, I, I want to read you this, right? John chapter 5, verse 19. Jesus said, the Son can do what? How many things can Jesus do by himself? Right? Except what he sees the Father do. So everything that Jesus did, he did it because he asked God and God told him. Now listen to me, if Jesus could do nothing by himself, how many things do you think you can do by yourself? <laughs> right? So we ask. 
So let me give you an example, right? And the, and the, and the, the, the situations, the answer changes based on the people in the situation. One time I had uh, 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 um, uh, someone, right, split, split the church and take people away. So I wept, I cried, I had to uproot things, I couldn't get bitter, go through it. And then, God, and then I asked the Lord, what do I do? And he said, call the person and have coffee and talk to him. So I did. And God, in that case, gave me that direction to do that. And then we worked some things out. Because I want to walk in love, forgiveness, and peace. I don't want anything to hinder me in my walk with God. But you see, that happened more than once. Okay, another time something similar happened and someone split the church. So I go through it again. Pray, weep, cry, say, you know, what's wrong with me? Then Jesus that time told him, it's not you. They betrayed me, they're going to betray you. When Jesus is perfect, they betrayed him, so they're going to betray you too. And then I ask the Lord, because I'm, this is one of the most vital points for me. Ask God. And the Lord said to me, no, don't call, don't do anything. So I didn't. I didn't even understand why, but I didn't. <clears throat> and just... Two weeks ago, now this just worked, this is while I was away out west. Two weeks ago, I got a message from someone that another pastor talked to him, and what he said to him touched him so much that he texted me, I'd like to talk to you. Do you see the difference? God had another way of dealing with this one, and it wasn't me. First, he had to get this other person to intervene soften his heart, and now he contacted me, and I do it. The main point is this. No matter what happens, ask God. <clears throat> Don't just imitate, because you're going to have to pick and choose. But it would be arbitrary. You're just going to pick, well, I'll just go and fight. But I have a lot of, lot of other examples in my life. You do too, right? But isn't it good that whenever something bad happens, God already has a plan for your recovery. I said, the day that something bad happens, God already has a plan for your recovery and your victory if you will only ask him for the details. Not a week later, not a month later, that very day. God already has a plan for victory and recovery. Right? Then let's go to verse 9. Verse 9, David and 600 men with him came to Bessera Valley, where some stayed behind. And then verse 10, two, and, and then David, so <coughs> 200 of them were too exhausted to cross the valley. 200 were too tired. We don't want to do it. We can't do it, right? So David just left them there. But he went on with the 400, continued the pursuit. So the fifth one is obvious, Right? Number five, act on the plan. Once God gives you a plan, act on it. Does that make sense? So you acknowledge the problem. You don't blame God. You're not bitter. You encourage yourself. You get a plan of action. You can put up number five, thanks. <coughs> and then what you do is you act on it. If God says pursue, you pursue. If God says, call that person, you call that person. If God says, take that person to dinner, you take that person to dinner. If God says to you, no, it's too early, the person is not ready yet for reconciliation, or, you know, he's going to put you down or hurt you or something, God doesn't want you in a situation where you're going to be demeaned and put down in any way, then God might say, just wait. I have to work in that person's heart. But act on the plan that God gives you. So when God said, go and pursue, then he went and he pursued. <clears throat> Whenever there's a challenge, are you listening? Whatever happens depends on what you do next. 
Whatever happens, right? Everything, your future depends on your reaction, on what you do next. If you blame God, you'll stay in bitterness. If you get depressed, you'll stay depressed. Right? If you don't inquire of the Lord, you won't have a plan. But if you trust Him and you ask Him for what to do next, that'll determine your future. Whether you win or whether you lose depends on what you do next, on how you react at that moment. Right? Huh? So that means this. Here's what's good is that you can immediately, all the time, take a really bad moment and turn it into your first step towards victory. That doesn't mean that things will magically change, but it means this, that any bad moment can be your first step towards victory. If you acknowledge it, if you feel it, right? If you don't blame God, if you don't get bitter, if you encourage yourself, stir yourself up, if you get a plan of action and then you act on the plan of action, any bad moment can be your first step towards victory. God is good, isn't he? <clears throat> Verse 11. I'm going to get through them. Verse 11, 1 Samuel 30, 11. Along the way, they found an Egyptian in a field and brought him to David. They gave him some bread to eat, <coughs> water to drink. So they're pursuing. They find, now, Egyptians were not friends of Israel. Remember, they were slaves in Egypt, and God delivered them from Egypt. This is Siri, and I don't know what she wants. I don't know why she interferes with my sermons. Look it up. Israelites delivered from Egypt, Siri. Look it up. You don't know what you mean, right? So here's my sixth thing that I see David do, is expect help from unexpected sources. Expect help from unexpected sources, right? So expect help from a Pharaoh. Expect help from unexpected sources. Expect help from a Cyrus. King Cyrus helped the Israelites rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. It's unexpected help because Cyrus was not a godly king by any means. You know that a, a real wise rabbi that I follow, uh, we have this saying, every pastor should have a rabbi and every rabbi should have a pastor, right? And of course, he knows Hebrew and so on, and I get a lot of things from him. And, and, and he asked me, you know, one time we had, <clears throat> in Toronto, we had uh, him come and do a Seder. Do, at our Easter, he did the, the, uh, the Seder, the, the, uh, the, the Jewish Easter, right? The Passover meal, which is our Easter. And then it was a wonderful ceremony. And then, you know, they have three matzahs that they pile up, three matzahs. They take the middle one and they break it. So he confided in me and he said, you know, the three matzahs are like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we don't know why we take Isaac and we break them. So I said, I know why you break the middle one. <laughs> For us it's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, right? For us it's the Trinity, and I said, and for us, it's clear why the, the middle one is broken, because it was Jesus' body that was broken, and Jesus the one on the cross. But he said, we don't know why we break Isaac. He said to me, there's a point to that. One time he said to me, we don't have in Hebrew a word for coincidence. Could it be that what the world calls coincidence is providence, is God doing something and you don't know it's God? 
many times, you know, you find yourself and something happens, whoa, that was like a beautiful coincidence. Maybe it was God just reaching out by his grace. So them finding an Egyptian in the middle of a field wasn't a coincidence. It was providence. It was God. He's an enemy. <clears throat> he was a part of the ones that raided the city. He was left behind. It says that they fed him. Always be good to your enemies. Right? Jesus said, love your enemies. The standard has changed. Right? And so, God used this person. It was unexpected help. And he's the one that led them to where they were, the enemy army was, so that David could ambush them and take his stuff back. Expect, amen, help from unexpected sources. Expect your unsaved boss to give you a bonus. Except when we started out in Toronto, uh, you know, and it was, at that time it was just Connie and I, we were young, we were going to university and, and had jobs, and we, put, we didn't tithe, we hundredth percent of it. We put everything in it because we had to pay the rent. Connie and I paid the rent. <clears throat> and one month we just couldn't make it, and the owner of the building, this building was on Jane Street, he wasn't saved, he looked at it, he said, you know, I like you and I like what you do, and for three months... I'm going to write off the rent as a charity. Uh, Would you give me a receipt for it? And for three months, you won't have to pay the rent. Isn't that good? That is help from unexpected sources. Right? You know, as a young pastor, you you know, that person has money. Sure, he'll give 10,000. It never works like that. I stop looking to people. I just trust God. Because God might, you know, use someone that you don't expect. Amen? Amen? But expect help from unexpected sources. So, there are many verses here that we will skip them because I want to get to verse 7 and finish, right? To, to my seventh point, I mean, and finish. But So, they feed him and, uh, and you know, they ask him, you know, where are they? And, and of course, this, this, this man says, uh, I'll tell you if, if you treat me right and if you won't kill me. And so, David promises and David blesses him, right? And then they come to where they were, and what happened when they come to where they were, right? Uh, the, they were, the, the enemy army was like partying because they thought that they had uh, a victory, right? So verse 16, let's jump down to verse 16. He led David down, this Egyptian brought David down, and there they were, the army scattered all over the countryside. They're eating and drinking and reveling because of the great amount of plundering that they had taken from the land of the Philistines and from Judah. See, <clears throat> Satan is parting because he thinks he won. But God gets him right when he thinks he's winning, God gets him. You should think in this verse, you should think of when Satan crucified Jesus, right? That Satan and hell was parting because they thought they finally defeated God. But on the third day, right in the middle of their party, right, God spoke and the Holy Spirit broke through and raised Jesus from the dead. Amen? So when Satan thinks he's got you, In reality, God has him right where he wants him. And just when you think that, you know, everything is over, God does his redeeming act and gets you out, right? Isn't that good? So they're there, they're partying, and they're drinking, right? And then in verse 17, it says that David attacked them from twilight until the evening, from morning till night, not a man escaped, escaped except 400 young men and so on. And then verse, the next verse, it says that the, uh, the give, me, give me the next verse. It says that they recovered all. David got back everything that the Amalekites had taken. David got back everything that the Amalekites had taken. Isn't that good? So there's my seventh thing that David did is 
get back what the devil stole. Get back what he stole. Amen? Take back what he stole. Glory. Is that good? So David got back everything that the devil stole. Hallelujah. We used to sing a song. Anybody remember it? Going to the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from me. Do you remember that? Take back what he stole from me. Take back what he stole from me. I went in the enemy's camp and I took back what he stole from me. Right? No, Satan, you can't have my stuff. Amen? You can't have my stuff, right? Recover all. Take back what the devil stole. And then, you know, it's really, 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 I, li I like uh, this verse too. I think we want to read it, right? Um, David took everything back. Verse 19, nothing was missing. Nothing was missing, right? Small, great, son, daughter, Everything, he brought everything back, and then he said in verse 20, what you have to say is, this is David's plunder. In other words, you have to say, is my stuff, right? It's mine. God gave it to me. Satan, you can't have my stuff. You believe that? Amen. Amen. Say it with me. Satan, you cannot have my stuff. Say, I take it back in Jesus' name. Amen. So I'm going to stop here. Now, next week, I'm going to take many of these and expound on them. I'm going to take them over in the New Testament, in life's Paul, in Paul's life, rather, Paul's life and, and give you more because there's a lot more. But what I wanted to do this morning was to just go through the text first and give you all these seven things. And you know, I had prepared this, but just before, and, and thank God the media department was kind enough because if you notice, I was in my office, right? Because I was put in this, this division of splitting it like this, I just got before from the Lord, just before service. He said, do it this way instead of that other way, and it's better. So I go through the text, we get this. Next week, we're going to take many of these and amplify and use the life of Paul, and I'll show you, I'll give you more on how to encourage yourself, how not to get bitter, right? How to expect help and so on. We'll go to some other verses that complete this, right? So here you have them. Go, go, go quickly through them. One... What is it? What's the first one? Acknowledge the problem, right? Now, you're going to stay depressed? No. You're going to stay down? No. But you're going to say, yeah, okay, that happened, right? And two is don't blame God. Don't get bitter, meaning don't get bitter. Don't blame God. God, God loves you too much to do that. And God doesn't make mistakes, right? Not a mistake. Then three, encourage yourself in the Lord. So you start right away, right? I'll, talk, I'll, I'll expound on this more next week. And then four, get a plan of action. That's vital. Do, do you understand how vital this is? Do not move. Do not do anything. Do not imitate anyone in the Bible until you get the specifics from God. This is important because sometimes in the Bible, it's just which verse you pick. God might tell one thing to David, go fight, but in a similar situation, he told Jehoshaphat, no, don't fight, just praise. And the point is, if you praise when you're supposed to fight, it won't work. And vice versa. If you fight when you're supposed to praise, it won't work. The specifics change. It's vital that you do this. Get a plan of action. Every situation is different. God will tell you how to respond and what to do, right? And then five, act on it. 
When he says it, do it. Right? If he says wait, wait. If he says call, call. If he says bake a pie and go see the person, bake a pie and go see the person. Whatever God says. <coughs> Expect help from unexpected sources. And then seven, seven, go get your stuff back. Because it's yours. It's yours. See, there's an attitude that you got to have. We'll look at it next week. But Moses said, you know, when Pharaoh said, yeah, you can go, but you leave, the, you, leave, you leave the cows here. Moses said, we're not even, we're not giving, not even a hoof. Not even a hoof. If God says it's mine, it's mine. Don't even give an inch. Amen? That's called the spirit of faith. Hallelujah. Did the word bless you? You're not, we're not going to sing the enemy's camp, uh, take back. I didn't think so, but you know, it's old, but it's good. Stand up, stand up a moment. Do it. I take back what the devil stole. Just go like this.